So uh, I, I mean this as a compliment. Your book does not necessarily read like you are an economist. <laughs> like, um, it, 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 Thank it's, you. <laughs> yeah, I, it centers around this call for an economic bill of rights. Um, but most economists I found treat like economi uh, economics as this science, as something fairly distinct from society. And your book makes it like does makes the opposite pitch essentially, um, and it was it, it's about what it means to truly be free and to truly have rights in America. Um, just I guess talk a little bit about the fact that you're you're an economics professor, and this is not necessarily the typical book that your field kind of produces. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I think that's a, a great way to kick off this conversation. Let me let me start with how I got into economics. I don't know about you, but like when you ask your average five year old what they want to do when they get older, uh, you know, they might want to be a nurse or a teacher or a doctor. I wanted to run an aquarium. That was always my dream. <laughs> Didn't quite shake out. Um, but you know, uh, coming out of high school, I actually went to culinary school and I worked in kitchens all through high school. And that's what initially got me interested in economics. It was working in the back of the house in restaurants, largely along, along the line, uh, along on the line with immigrants who have been working their ass off 50, 60 hours a week, every single week for a year in and year out. And maybe they worked up to making $14 an hour instead of $12 an hour, but they certainly weren't living that American dream. Um, then comes along the 2008 financial crisis, and it, you know, I just saw it bring not only my family down to their knees, but tens of millions of Americans lost their homes, their jobs, and everything they had worked tirelessly for. And I was just sitting here scratching my head thinking, how could this thing we call the economy ruin so many lives? And that's when I began my study of economics, not because I was passionate about supply and demand, but because I cared about people, and I cared about people having quality livelihoods. And so that's really what brought me to, to studying the questions of the economy. Um, and what set me forth on my book was, you know, realizing that, hey, we live in the richest nation to have ever existed. If we distributed wealth equally, each of us would have more than half a million dollars in our bank accounts. If we distributed income equally, each of us would have about $100,000 a year on top of that coming in every single year. Now, you know, we wouldn't be living the Jeff Bezos life, but we'd all be doing pretty damn well. But of course, we know that's not the society we've built. That's not how we've chosen to organize it. So I wanted to better understand how are we so rich, yet we still have 40 million Americans in poverty and another 100 million Americans a step away from poverty? And how are we so rich, that, but we can't solve our basic needs like providing people with health care and education and housing? And what would it actually take to fix those societal problems? And by centering human beings rather than how do we increase this thing we call GDP, uh, I, I think that the book takes a much more realistic and human approach to thinking about the economy than than what most readers would typically expect from picking up an econ book. And and, and I guess the the <clears throat> this is the societal ails. You can boil it down to unfettered capitalism, right? I mean, I, I, I that is a way to simplify it to a degree. But what I love that your book does is you kind of incorporate some political theory um, into it when you're speaking about the, the nature of rights in this country. Um, our Bill of Rights is so focused on negative rights, which is a, a libertarian conception of rights. It's free, think of it as freedom from something, right? And, and I remember studying this in school. Um, and if you're a little bit more focused on providing for the general welfare of, of people, you're going to be focused on positive rights, um, not freedom from something, but freedom to do something or to be able to um, to live your life in a certain way. And you 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 talk about this early on in your book, um, if you don't mind fleshing out that concept for people. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's really fascinating to me because we all learn the history of America. And we learn that the you know the Bill of Rights is core to who we are as a people, and that's true. But it's only part of the story. And and what we fail to really develop in, in our you know middle school and high school education is realizing that the founders were far more complex thinkers than what we learn them to be. Um, in fact, many of the early founders, people like Thomas Paine, Alexander Hamilton argue not only for negative rights, but also these positive rights that we need to, we as members of society should be entitled to things like education, housing, employment opportunities and the like, 
to be fully participating members of society. Um, what's really interesting is that this was also a core demand of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King, for example, fought tirelessly, of course, for the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Acts. But after those were passed, he pivoted his attention full time to focusing on economic rights. Why? Because for many of the founders, as for King, as for me, political rights, social rights, reproductive rights, for example, these crucial rights are um, in isolation insufficient to provide people with meaningful freedom to do and be what they have reason to value. That's the ultimate goal, to help people be able to live free lives where they can actually have real opportunity and choice in you know the type of life they structure they 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 build and structure you know if they actually want to go become a teacher or go become you know um a, a cook or you know whatever uh, you know whatever it might be um host a radio show perhaps uh but but we need these positive rights and these positive rights is the state saying we promise to give you these basic things to develop yourself as a full person and the, the positive right we're most familiar with here in the United States is a K through 12 of education. Every state has enshrined in its constitution that people have the right to an education. I grew up K through PhD in public schools, as a matter of fact. And those public, that public school system that I didn't have to pay for is precisely what helped develop me, you know, both as a voting citizen and as a member of our society, um, but also as a thinker and somebody that's then able to go out and, and write a book and think about how do we improve the society we live in. But when kids go to school, right, they don't they don't have to go show a receipt that they paid to enter the door, right? They just have a right to enter that public school and to receive that education simply by living here in this you know, country. And so I think it's up to us to think about what are the other rights necessary? We know that these political rights that we have aren't sufficient, right? What are the other rights necessary? And what I try to argue is that economic rights uh, such as the right to a job, the right to health care, the right to housing, which we can get into more detail later, are essential for us to fully realize our political rights. Um, you know, one of the, the political theorists who works on this, Isaiah Berlin, who kind of coined this conception of positive and negative freedom, talked about how to, to simply provide somebody with negative rights is to mock their condition. That if, if all you have is negative rights, you know, the Bill of Rights is meaningless, essentially, if you're starving or if you're homeless. You know, what, what good is that piece of paper to you if you can't meet your basic human needs? Right. And, and you know, it's um, the, the Bill of Rights being basically primarily concerned at that point with tyranny and things like that um, ends up in a, a, a structure of what is guaranteed to us that is, is, is heavily individualist um, and in a modern society uh, and under capitalism, it's insufficient to provide people with their basic needs, as you laid out with those um, statistics and just like with everybody's everyday reality. Uh, I, you mentioned MLK, and he was kind of playing with this concept before his assassination, as well as his opposition to the Vietnam War. Um, I think that that is uh, a key to kind of seeing where, you know, why he was so unpopular at the time of his death as well, because these were the kind of things that were threatening to the establishment. Um, and I think that's so important to pick up on yeah. for a moment because, you know, look, require or, or challenging the vote was one thing, but that's not what got him assassinated. What got him assassinated was really standing up against the war and fighting for universal economic rights. Right. He wasn't just fighting for economic rights for black America. He was building a cross race, cross class coalition to essentially challenge capitalism. He talked yeah. extensively about how we needed to abolish capitalism and build something new. And when you challenge capital, right, when you challenge the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks of the world, that's when shit hits the fan around here. Uh, and I think it's just such an important context for us to, to struggle with and think about, you know, what we as, as, you know, Americans deserve. And we certainly deserve more than we're getting right now. Certainly. And then, you know, uh, you, you, I think you may, may have mentioned or I wrote it down, Thomas Paine is uh, somebody who you borrow from and speak about his influence on this, as well as FDR, who before his death was moving towards a like kind of more um, rebuilding phase of America as the war effort was was winding down. Um, and as the country had gotten through the worst of the Great Depression, it was what do we build next? And 
um, he was also talking about the concept of an economic bill of rights, of, of these positive rights being enshrined in legislation. That's right. This idea of an economic bill of rights really does come from Roosevelt. And what I try to do in the book is kind of draw this um, a, a linear history from, say, the founders to the radical Republicans and Lincoln through Roosevelt and the New Deal to, you know, King in the civil rights movement. And then more recently, you know, uh, some of the progressive movements, the squad um, in the House at this moment who are pushing for these economic rights. But Roosevelt's really the one who put this idea of an economic bill of rights on the map. It was actually in 1944, his uh, second to last State of the Union address, where he called on Congress to enact an economic bill of rights to deliver full and meaningful freedom to the American people. What Roosevelt was searching for here was kind of the, the cherry on top of the New Deal, so to say. It was the, the most transformative part of the New Deal, where in his words, we would actually enact cradle to grave security for all Americans. Now let's not forget what you know World War II was actually about for Roosevelt. It was about his four freedoms. And one of those key four freedoms was the freedom for want. And how could he actually guarantee that to the American people? It was through this economic bill of rights. Unfortunately, when Roosevelt passed, um, you know, Harry Truman at the time was his vice president and, and Truman was uh, a far from anything we could call a progressive. You know, I think this is one of the biggest mistakes Roosevelt made um, in his career was to allow Truman on the ticket rather than to keep Henry Wallace, who was a right. staunch defender of economic rights uh, on the ticket, who I, I do think the future of the Democratic Party in this country would have been fundamentally different had that change not occurred. Uh, but but unfortunately, you know, that that's what we had. So so this idea didn't die with Roosevelt, though, it was really, you know, kind of picked up by the civil rights movement. And that's something that we fail to talk about and fail to teach when we discuss the civil rights movement. In fact, even after King was assassinated, the idea continued on. It was his life partner and intellectual partner, Coretta Scott King who continued to fight for these economic rights. And in fact, uh, I know you all have talked about the Federal Reserve on the show before. The Federal Reserve's dual mandate actually comes out of the Economic Bill of Rights. The fact that the Federal Reserve has to pursue full employment was something won by the Civil Rights Movement, won by Coretta Scott King, who well, was fighting for the funny. right to a job. That's funny because that is not, that is not their literal stated intention at all anymore. Um, no. I mean, we, we've we've covered uh, statements made by past Fed chairs, by Larry Summers, right, about uh, the 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 uh, level of unemployment um, that you can maintain in order to uh, keep inflation down is their theory. Right. Um, but full employment would be based on like Fed orthodoxy from the past few decades or like since then in this neoliberal era is that there has to be a certain level of unemployment to keep workers in line and then secondary yeah keep inflation down too i mean that that has been seemingly abandoned by anybody um even on uh on the democratic side of things um although yeah, I, yeah. I, sh I will say that yellen is critical of of that asser assertion but but doesn't go far enough right like that is that is not um anywhere in the discourse right now no, it, it's absolutely not. But this is a co-optation of this idea, quote unquote, that we call full employment, right? Uh, full employment is in the Fed's mandate, but full employment doesn't mean to me 12 million Americans unemployed. It doesn't mean four or five or even 6% unemployment, which is how the Federal Reserve has modern day defined full employment. That's all BS. And this is the Federal Reserve saying, how do we get around this idea where we're supposed to provide full employment? Well, we come up with this new artificial concept called the NIRU, the non-accelerating inflation rate of, uh, rate of unemployment, that we we push out and and then say, ah, huh, 15 million Americans unemployed? Yes, that's full employment. Um, if you ask me what full employment is, is I'm going to give you the same response as I think most Americans would if you ask them. It means if somebody wants a job, they can get one. Right? That's full employment. And I don't think that's a radical concept. What's, what's fascinating is we did polling on this, actually. And this isn't a left or right issue. Most Americans agree full employment means you can get a job if you want or need one. Full stop. It's not, you know, we are not tinkering around with what the Federal Reserve calls our star and, and, 
and you know, kind of coming up with all these artificial ways to to claim we're at full employment despite the fact that we're not. Um, you know, if we look at the labor market today, most economists are saying not that we're at full employment; they're saying we're beyond full employment. I mean, that's just a crazy idea to think about. How could we be beyond full employment? I mean, does that mean that most workers have seven jobs? Like. No, I mean, it's true that some workers have two jobs, but it's because their wages are so low that they can't make ends meet. 